did the gospel. When Jesus was preaching to the disciples, he had plenty of disciples. And when the hard message that he preached, it says, unless you eat my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part of me. And the disciples started walking away, saying, oh, this is too much, this is too much. And they all walked away except his 12 disciples, and he turned to Peter and said, are you going to leave me too? And Peter said, where can we go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. Where else can we turn to? If you turn away from Jesus, who are you going to turn to? What are you going to turn to? Who are you going to turn to? Peter said, you're the only one that has eternal We can't go. We know it's a hard message. Yeah, sometimes the Word of God is hard because we're sinful. See, God is holy. We're sinful. God is right. We're wrong. All the time. Not some of the time. All the time. So it gets hard because we're not right. God is right. God is holy. But even when it gets hard, where are you going to turn? You say, well, it's too hard to be a Christian. It's too, you know, it's too much. How, how, how can we do this? Well, where are you going to turn? What, what are you going to turn to that's going to be easy? Nothing. Who are you going to turn to that's going to help you? Who are you going to turn to that's going to love you? Who are you going to turn to that's going to forgive you? Who are you going to turn to? There's nobody. That's what we just say. There's no one else that we can turn to. Praise the Lord. Well, great. We're going to, we're going to end this message on this series on the house of God. I hope you got the picture. We're going to finish the picture today. The house of God. This is going to be it. Remember our purpose for this series of messages. That we can see the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, like heaven sees it. Like God sees it. Not like man sees it. Not like the traditions of men. The, the, the philosophies of men. But the way God sees it through his word. What are we? What is the church all about? We've got to get a good vision of that. We don't want to get our vision of it. So you got people out there, they got their own vision of what the church should be. I don't even want my vision. I want to see the church as God sees it. And we're in this series, this is the ninth one, I'm going to end with this unless God says something else to me. We've been getting uh, revelations, and I, I titled this, this message, this last message, God's Spiritual House. God's spiritual house. And we've been getting revelations over the past messages from the Old Testament types and shadows that, that, that showed you what the future church was going to be about. It was, it was symbolic and, and uh, uh, there were uh, shadows and types of everything. The feast days, we covered the, the Jewish feast days, how they pointed to the New Testament church. Then we looked at the city of Jerusalem, that is the supposedly the holy city of God. We looked at the temple in Jerusalem as a type of the church. The temple in Jerusalem what was called the house of God. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was at. That's where the presence was. That's where they did all the sacrifices. They did all the rituals. And uh, that was all a type of... Christ. Everything in there was a type of Christ. Everything they did was a type of Christ. But the Apostle Paul in the New Testament in the book of Acts, he was speaking in a Jewish synagogue and remember in the beginning the, the, the Christian church was not the Jews. The Jews are the only ones that had the word of God. They were the only ones that was waiting for Messiah to come. So Paul, the Apostle, was speaking in a Jewish synagogue, and even out in the marketplace, and he was speaking on the resurrection of the dead. Christ's resurrection and the resurrection of the dead. And he was in the city of Athens, Greece, 
and he must have been preaching out in the marketplace. And there were some philosophers. Greece was full of philosophers. Athens, Greece especially, was full of philosophers. They, they, they wanted to hear the newest thing. They, they, everybody had a thought. Everybody had a philosophy on life. That's where he was at. He was in Greece, and, and these philosophers heard him speaking to people about the resurrection of the dead. So this opened up their ears. They said, well, what, what is this babbler trying to say here? He's saying some stuff we never heard before. And so they, they approached the Apostle Paul and invited him to speak to them and lecture them on what he's talking about. So they brought him to a place, an arena called the Areopagus in Athens, Greece. And they take it, let's, let's pick that up in Acts chapter 17. It says they took him and brought him into a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. That's all these guys did. You got something new we want to hear. Paul then stood up in a meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens. I see that in every way you are very religious. You got that? Yes. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. See, Greece had statues of gods. They, they believed in many gods. They had statues on every corner. This is what Paul was walking through the, through the city, seeing all of these gods that man has set up. But then he says, I even found an altar with this inscription on it, to an unknown God. In other words, they were so uh, uh, superstitious that they felt they might have left one God out. So to not have a God come against them, they set up an altar and to the unknown God. In case we forgot you, I don't know who you are, yeah. we're, we're going to have this for you. Yeah. So Paul says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now how many people, they are in philosophies and, and, and they're in religions and they they are worshiping things they are ignorant of simply because of tradition. They're going through tradition, doing things, don't even know why. Don't even know why they do it. They just do it. They don't even know who they're doing it for. They don't even know the God in which they are worshiping. Many people. Many people. So, Paul said, so you are ignorant of everything you worship, and this is what... I'm going to proclaim to you. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He says, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So Paul made it plain that the house of God is not something that man made. You got that? The house of God is not something that man made. 300 years after the beginning of the church, the church backslid. They started building all these big temples and cathedrals and, and all of that, thinking that that's where God was going to be. But Paul said right from the get-go, God doesn't dwell in temples made by man's hands as if God needs you to build some kind of house for him. He don't need you. He created everything. 
Why does he need us to build a place for him to dwell? He built everything. He built the universe. God don't need anything from us. We need everything from him. Come on. Everything from him. So the house of God is nothing that man has made. Because Jesus said to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. You're not going to build anything. Don't think you're building anything. Don't think we're building anything here. God is building this. We're just being obedient. But God's going to build it. We're not going to build anything. See, religion and philosophies of men won't do it. Don't do it. That's why I rather believe God. If it's either believing some man, I rather believe God. I have the choice of believing what the world thinks and what God thinks. I'm going to stick with God. Amen. I'm, I'm going to stick with God. And the psalmist said in Psalm 127.1, he says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. In other words, if you try to build a church in your own, try to do your it's for nothing. He said, Unless the Lord watches over the city, the gods stand watch in vain. If you think you're going to protect yourself, you think you can stand on your own, you ain't going to make it. Then Peter tells the church what the spiritual house is really made of in his letter. Is for the letter of 1 Peter. Peter says this in chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be the holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter saying every one of us is a living stone that God is building in his house. That's, how he, how, that's his house. His house is built off of living stones that he has chosen. You just can't jump into this building. He has to take you. He has to make you to fit into this building. Say, Because he's a holy God now, remember. Sin's got to go. He's got to cleanse you up. Only God can build a spiritual house because the church is not of human origin. It's supernatural. Listen, when I came to Christ 46 years ago, when I became born again, I knew this was religion. Somehow I tapped into the supernatural. Something touched my life and it wasn't man. It was God. Amen. So the church of Jesus Christ is not an organization. It's not a building. It's not anything man could conjure up. It's what God has done. He takes living stones, people that repent of their sins and, and exercise faith in Jesus Christ to where their life is changed. Boom! You become a stone and he places you. He places you in the building. And it don't look like anything you think it looks like. I've told you many times. Everything that calls itself the church is not the church. Everybody that calls themselves Christian is not Christian. But God knows who they are. God knows who they are. So before we can really get a revelation of this spiritual house, we've got to go first to a type and a shadow in the Old Testament. The first temple that was built in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was at that time was called the holy city of God. Remember, Jerusalem was called the holy city of God, not Rome. Rome was the capital to of, of man. Never Rome. It was always Jerusalem. That's why they're fighting over that city today. So the first temple in Jerusalem that was built was built by King Solomon. King Solomon was King David's son. And it wasn't built 
until Solomon was exalted as the king of Israel. There was no temple until Solomon was exalted as the king of Israel. So the king must be exalted before a, the temple could be built. Now, let's go to that in second, uh, First Chronicles chapter 22 in the Old Testament. David said, uh, Dave, this is King David, he said, my son Solomon is young and inexperienced and a house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all the nations. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon. And I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who will build the house for my name. He will be my son. I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So the son must be chosen over the house. The son's got to be chosen. King David had many sons because he had many wives, which produced many problems. You want more problems? Get more than one wife. <laughs> and people say, well, they had them in the Old Testament. Well, go look and see what it, what it cost them. Nobody had peace. <laughs> Nobody had peace. David didn't have. It. In fact, David had two of them son, many sons that he had. They wanted to replace their father David as king. And the first one was named Absalom, who tried to kill his father to be king. His attempt was to take it by force. But it cost him his life to try to do that. His attempt was to take it by force. The second son he had was Adonijah. He assumed because he was the oldest son that it belonged to him. So he goes around telling everybody it's his. Well, he was also killed because he wasn't the one chosen. See, 1 Chronicles 28.5 says this. David says, of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever, for if he is uns unswerving in carrying out my commands and laws as is being done at this time. So Solomon's kingship was mentioned twice. God kept telling him who, which one of his sons was going to build the temple for him in Jerusalem. First Chronicles 29, 22 says, They ate and drank with, gr with great joy in the presence of the Lord that day. They acknowledged Solomon son of David as king a second time, anointing him before the Lord to be ruler in Zadak to be priest. So Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king in place of his father David. He prospered and all Israel obeyed him. All the officers and warriors as well as all King David's sons pledged their submission to King Solomon. It was settled. See, everything was settled. They, they settled that, that Solomon was going to be king, so everybody submitted themselves to the king. 
If we want to see God do great things here, guess what? We all got to submit ourselves to the king. There's only one king here. His name is Jesus. We got to all submit ourselves to the king and let him build his house. He will build his house as we submit to him. And he's going to lead us and God is. So the son was chosen and everyone in the house submitted to him. We already know who the king is here. He's a king. He's our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There were no debates about Solomon. We don't have to debate who's king here. We don't have to have doubts about who's king here. There's only one king. His name's Jesus. And uh, so, but the son must be exalted in the house. In this, in 1 Chronicles 29, 25, it says, The Lord highly exalted Solomon in the sight of all Israel and bestowed on him royal splendor such as no king over Israel ever had before and never had since. God exalted Solomon right in front of Israel. God made sure that all of Israel knew that Solomon is who God chose to be king. God gave him royal splendor like no other king had before. They had kings all over the world come to see what, what God did for Solomon. God gave him wealth, riches, honor like no other king on earth ever had. God gave him wisdom like no other king ever had. People used to come from all over the world to listen to Solomon speak because he had the wisdom of God. God gave him. When the chosen son in the house is exalted, everybody gets blessed. Watch this now. 2 Chronicles 1.15 The king, that Solomon, made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone. And cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Because the king was exalted, everybody under them prospered. Think about that. This was the earthly symbolic house of the church. The spiritual house of God. Solomon chose to be king over the earthly house. Jesus is chosen son to be king over God's spiritual house. Amen. Now look, 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 look what's happening here. Because everybody submitted to Solomon, everybody got blessed. Everybody in Solomon's kingdom was blessed. They had more gold. They said gold was like stone. They have so much gold and so much silver, so much prosperity in the house. Why? Because they submitted to the king, the king that God chose to be over them. Now we have a king that was chosen to be over us. See, when Jesus is exalted in the house, when Jesus is exalted and everybody submits to him, Everybody gets blessed. The most blessed place you can be in your life is submitting your entire life to Jesus Christ, the King who has everything. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. This is the New Testament. The writer says, but Christ is, the, is faithful as the son over God's house. And we are his house. Who's his house? Who's the spiritual house? We are. Not an organization. Not a denomination. It's every born again believer is a living stone that God has put in his house. That he's building. He's not finished yet. Because you see... But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are that house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Because you see, a greater house than the earthly house had to be established. That's why Solomon's temple was destroyed. 
It was destroyed because they quit worshiping God. God sent the enemies in. They destroyed that temple. The piece of wall that's up there now in Jerusalem where all the Jews are praying to, that was the second temple. That was Herod's temple. That was the temple Jesus went in when hit in his earthly ministry. That one got destroyed too. Jesus said it was going to be destroyed. And it was. So earthly, God don't want earthly temples. He's got a temple. We're it. We're it. Paul says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you know that? God doesn't dwell in temples made by man's hands. He's going to dwell in temples he made. He made you. And he made you for one purpose. That he might dwell in you. That his spirit might dwell in you. And if His Spirit's not in you, you don't belong to Christ. Come on. You can have all the religion you want. You can have all the religion you want. If His Spirit's not in you, you're not His temple. That's not my words. It's the words of Paul. God's Word. I'm going to tell you in a second. You see, there had to be a greater house. See, we've we got to look at the church as God looks at it. God has believers all over the world. I've been uh, pretty much on the other side of the world already. There's believers over there. They don't look like us and don't talk like us. But they're believers. And God knows who they are. See, they're from every tongue, every nation, every race, every creed, everything. They're there. God knows who they are. God knows who His Spirit's dwelling in. He knows. So when God looks at the church, He don't look at one place. He's looking at the whole world. See, that's his spiritual house. It's where his spirit dwells. It's his house. So, uh, so a greater house had to be built. See, a greater house is the one he's building right now with living stones. Every believer that comes, every sinner that repents and comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is another living stone added to that house. And he's building it. Every, probably every second of every day, somebody in the world is hearing the gospel and coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the son must be exalted in the spiritual house. The spiritual house is the church that is built with every born-again believer, every living stone that is put in place must exalt the chosen son. We must exalt. That's why God saved you. God didn't save you just to go sit somewhere. God saved you that you might be a stone that would exalt the king. The king, the chosen son, has to be exalted. Every one of us should reflect God's new creation. Isn't what Paul says? Any man who is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. The old has passed away. Everything has become new. And that newness is the reflection of Jesus Christ in your life. That's what we reflect. That's what we reflect. That's what we should reflect. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Well, how is Christ going to be exalted in, in his body? Because he's a temple, like you are, like every one of us that has the spirit of the living God in us. When you've been born again, you get the spirit. Everything in the church begins and ends. With us exalting the Son in the spiritual house. That's how it begins. That's how it's going to end. We're going to be around the throne of God. The King of Kings. The Lord of Lords is going to be sitting on the throne. And we are going to be exalting Him. You better get used to it now. You want to go to heaven. That's what we're going to be doing. That's the whole purpose of the church. Is that Jesus Christ be exalted. Nothing else. 
No philosophies of men, no traditions of men, no, no worldly wisdom, but Christ be exalted in the house. If we don't do it, as Brother Joe, Pastor Joseph said, we're wasting our time. Just well pack up and get out of here. If we're not going to exalt the king, we just well pack up and get out of here. Wasting our time. But when we come together, that's why we have to sing. That's why we have to worship him. See, when David's son Solomon was exalted as king, he immediately began to build the temple. Let me show you this symbolic here. The church began on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, Jesus told 120 disciples before he ascended into heaven, go wait into Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. And you're going to be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, into all the parts of the world because my spirit's going to be in you. That's, that's the spiritual house of God. When you see somebody full of God's Holy Spirit, you're looking at the house of God. You're looking at a living stone that was placed in the house of God. When the Son of God was exalted to the right hand of God, remember what happened. He ascended into heaven. The disciples watched him. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Right hand of God. From that moment on, he sent the Spirit of God to those 120 disciples and the house started being built. The temple of God began to be built on that day. That was the birth of of the spiritual house of God, the church. Those disciples were not the church. There wasn't the church. They were believers. They were waiting for what God promised them. They were in an upper room, 120 of them, fasting and praying. And the Bible said the Holy Spirit came in like a rushing mighty wind. Tongues of fire began to set on each one of their heads. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They became the spiritual house of God, the church. It's not the church if God's spirit is not in it. It's something else. It's something man has made. If God's spirit is not in it, it's not the church. It's not the spiritual house. And uh, in fact, you're not a Christian until the Holy Spirit dwells in you by faith. Look what Paul says. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. It says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Do, do I have to interpret that? People <laughs> say, you know how you interpret how, Do you have to interpret that? Paul said, either you have the Spirit of Christ in you or you don't. That's it. And if you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, you don't belong to Christ. Don't even claim you're a Christian. Because you're not. You're not. You might be something else, but you're not a Christian. Paul says, unless the Spirit of Christ is in you. That is the spiritual house of God. Every person that has Christ's Spirit in them is a living stone built on that house. Now you can be a stone and not be living. But you're not a living stone till the Holy Spirit comes in you. So, the Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost. That's when the church became a spiritual house. It wasn't a spiritual house until that happened. And then look what happened. The first message that, that the church preached was on the day of Pentecost. After the Spirit of God came into them, the church began to operate from right from the get-go. When the Spirit of God came into the church, Peter's out on the street preaching to thousands of Jews. 
And look what one part, this is not all of it said, but in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, this is what it said. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out on what you now see and hear. They thought these disciples were drunk. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They said, these guys are drunk. They said, no, we ain't drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> said, what you see is what was promised. We're filled with God's Holy Spirit. That's what it's all about. We're Holy Ghost people. You call us Holy Rollers if you want. Come on. I'd rather roll in heaven than walk in hell. <laughs> See, everything takes its rise from it, the exaltation of the Son. See, we got to be a church that exalts Christ. Exalts Jesus. That's all we need to do. Jesus, if I be lifted up, I'm drawing men into me. Let's keep lifting Christ up. Let's keep exalting Him. There's no other name. There's no other way. There's no other life. There's no other way. It's down. People told me, Hey, Carl, you, you're narrow-minded. Yes, I am. You need to be narrow-minded. Your, your mind needs to be set on Christ. Your mind needs to be set on the only name under heaven by which you're going to be saved. That's how it is. There ain't many. It's one. Jesus said the road is narrow. It ain't wide. You can't just take any path you want, any path you think is good. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. He might be, he might be, be sincerely committed to a road that's going to lead him to death. Just because you're sincere don't mean you're going to make it. You can be sincerely wrong. Many people are. Remember, God's right. We're wrong. Yes. If your philosophy comes against what God says, guess who's right and who's wrong? God's right. Amen. We're wrong. All right. Let me give you a little church history. Every great revival, if you study history, the Protestant, the Protestant uh, uh, faith that came out of Catholicism was by, by Martin Luther who began to study this and realize what the early church did and what that church was doing. He said, I got to get out of here. And he wrote the theses, nailed it on the church in Rome. You guys got off track here. You guys got off track. Every great revival or move of God comes when we recognize who Jesus is. Yes. Once we recognize and exalt Jesus, get away from traditions of men. Many, many revivals and church movements and awakenings was a result of the revelation of who Christ is. See, and what he means to us. See, what's true in history is really also true in our lives today as a believer. We have so much, we have so much trouble, so much spiritual weakness, so much failure. It's because of one thing. We haven't submitted ultimately to the Lordship of our spiritual king and savior. When we do that, when we come as a spiritual house of God and submit ourselves, not partially, but I'm talking about selling out to Christ. When we do that, 
if we don't do that, we haven't exalted him. The spiritual house which we are and exists for this very purpose. And, 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 and what stuck with me is that when Solomon was exalted as king, and everybody submitted to him, everybody prospered. You want to prosper in life? Submit to Christ. Give in. Just sell out. Sell out. He has everything. Everything you need, he has. When we exalt him, together as the spiritual house of God, rejoicing in the fact that God has chosen him, there's only one son. God chose him. We got to exalt him. We got to exalt him. That's what we're about. That's the only reason why we exist. There's not another reason why you exist as a believer other than exalting Christ. Your life should exalt Him. Your words should exalt Him. Your actions should exalt Him in everything we do. Let's exalt Him today. I want you to stand with me. I want you to gather around this altar, and that's what we're going to do. When the Son is exalted, the blessings start flowing. The blessings of God begin to flow. Let's exalt him. Let's exalt him. <coughs> Boy, those lights a little bit. Okay, it's on time.